Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Rockwell. I'm the director of the Kuhl Institute for Advanced Study. And it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the second day of our Around the World Conference. For those of you who uh, uh, don't know about this conference, I, I encourage you to go to the aroundtheworld.ualberta.ca site and, and look at uh, the documentation we have there. We also have, for example, archives of uh, previous conferences. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we here at the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledge that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Today's topic is art and in the Anthropocene, a debate on sustainability and ecology. Comments are more than welcome, and there are different ways that you can uh, enter comments. Uh, if you go to the live streaming page, aroundtheworld.ualberta.ca, you can add comments directly beneath, or if you like to tweet, if you use the hashtag ATW2018, that will also show up in a stream on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the page. So I'd like to now introduce the chairs for today's session, uh, Natalie Loveless and Jesse Beyer. Natalie teaches in art and design here at the University of Alberta. Jesse is a PhD student in education, and together they run the fabulous Social Justice and Research Creation Collaboratory. So, over to you. In that, you can go to researchcreation.ca, and um, uh, that's also funded by the Cool Institute for Advanced Study, which is the um, funding body and organizing body for these conferences. Um, so first, hello, and thank you for being here. I want to start us off. I'm going to echo Jeffrey um, and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this territory for centuries. We're speaking to you here today from Treaty 6 territory. This is the traditional land of the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. Now, I'm echoing what Jeffrey said because to take the time to make treaty and land acknowledgements is not only polite, it's not only a way of acknowledging my settler and visitor status here, but it's politically urgent and necessary to any gathering that's attentive to social and ecological justice in times of unprecedented settler colonial petrocapital genocide, which is indeed the way that we think on this panel of the times that we're living in today. So we're privileged to be thinking together today from across many territories. Um, and we're doing this by um, being brought together through digital technologies, um, but also much labor. Um, labor by the organizers, Jeffrey Rockwell and Chelsea Mia, Oliver Rossier and Adam Dombra Dombovari, and also the technical wizards that are making this possible, uh, Claire Peters and Grant Wong. Today, Jesse and I look forward to introducing you to six artists who are working on ecological issues. After a short six-minute video, um, we are going to share the questions that we posed to our artists in advance of this session. Um, and I want to say just one thing about the way that we posed these questions. So we didn't just invite artists who were in a kind of proof of concept way, um, in alignment with our perspectives. Instead, we started off by choosing six artists who we were genuinely curious about and invested in and interested in. Um, and then we formed questions that matter to us and shared those with these artists. So what we'd like is to hold a rich and invested discussion with the artists and with you. Um, and while you're listening, please take notes on terms or concepts or ideas that you're not familiar with, nodes of curiosity or interest that you want to speak more about, and bring those back at the end into the discussion that we have. And what we'd like to do, instead of having a set of um, uh, artistic experts here sharing their work um, to whom we could pose questions, though we could do that, we'd also like to hold a rich and invested kind of round table-ish discussion and let that conversation go um, wherever it needs to go. So um, with that said, I think we'll pass over to the introductory video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we're ready for our next. Yes. So, cue video. <laughs> Karen Bolander is an artist researcher who seeks untold stories within muddy, multi-species meshes. For almost two decades now, Karen's creative research has engaged multi-species performance, 
mainly with a family of beloved asses, as a means to seek more inclusive ways to frame tangled matters and storyings of all agents and energies in the environment. As principal investigator of the Rural Alchemy Workshop, also known as RA, she explores dirty words and entangled wisdoms of earthly bodies through performance, writing, video, and sound. In the company of she-asses, alias, and passenger, and a far-flung herd of collaborators, the Rural Alchemy Workshop cultivates interspecies forays like raw ass milk soap, the she-ha transhuman series, gut sounds lullaby, and the unnaming of alias. In both long-ass journeys and barnyard homemakings, various projects investigate tangled questions and ethical conundrums that flow through and across generations of bodies, mother and other tongues and care practices, to question how we might perform wider cares and attentions to vital, unseen relations in ever-shifting ecologies. Krista Donner is an artist, mother, curator, and organizer who investigates the human-animal body and its metaphors through a variety of media, from large-scale drawing and installation to guided visualizations and small press publications. Her practice often incorporates social exchange and collaboration rooted in personal narrative and sensory experience. As Krista writes, My studio practice explores the biological and social systems of humans in conversation with other organisms proposing speculative systems through which to skill share, adapt, and evolve. She also considers her experience as a mother and an educator as highly relevant to her artistic practice. For instance, as she engages with young people, she finds her time horizons greatly expanded, offering a deeper connection both to the past and to many possible futures. As such, she aims to activate such time travel more broadly and intentionally as an entry point toward confronting the realities of climate breakdown as well as finding a way forward. <clears throat> Andrew Yang is an artist working across the flux of the natural cultural spectrum with special interest in the Anthropocene proposal. In exploring the Anthropocene proposition, Andrew aims to understand how humans, non-humans, creatures and landscapes relate and negotiate being as dynamic parts in a planetary whole. Andrew has written extensively on multi-species and human-non-human relations, for example with parasites, insects and bees, and is part of Deep Time Chicago, an art research activism initiative formed in the wake of the Anthropocene curriculum program at HKW in Berlin, Germany. Deep Time Chicago aims to explore one core idea, that is, the idea that humanity, as a geological agency, is capable of disrupting the Earth system and inscribing present modes of existence into deep time. By knitting together group readings, guided walks, lectures, panels, screenings, performances, publications, and exhibitions, Deep Time Chicago develops public research trajectories wherein Chicago area inhabitants might grapple with the crucial questions of global ecological change. Mia Feuer is a research-driven interdisciplinary sculptor, not to mention mother, maker, and teacher, who was born in Winnipeg and currently resides in Oakland, California. Mia is interested in the post-natural landscape, that is, the visible sites where human interaction, be it personal, social, political, or financial, has altered or is in the process of rapidly changing the land, and thus our relationship to it. Through field research, collaborations, and a deep fascination with natural and synthetic materials, Mia explores concepts related to the transfiguration, the transformation, and the interconnectedness of humans, animals, machines, and environments. She collects materials, timelines, sounds, forms, textures, experiences, and stories, while also utilizing various technological mediations, including 3D scanners, a range of mold-making techniques, field recorders, and hydrophones to create immersive installations and allegorical objects. Leanne Olson is a photo-based artist born in Toronto and raised in Edmonton. Olson's artistic practice centers on documenting impermanence and adaptation to changing environmental conditions. The subjects in Olson's photographs are often described as otherworldly, yet they're real, they're here, and they are of the era of right now. Interested in reflections, projections, and the societal necessity to document the development of ego over time, 
Olson's photographic work is driven by a curiosity in the intersection of behavioral science and environmental adaptation. For instance, for four years, Olson photographed disappearing Alberta lakes and sulfurous streams for a project called Where a Lake Once Was. Since February, Olson has been exploring the triangular formations of the remnants of consumption in her artist residency at the Edmonton Waste Management Centre. Scott Smallwood is a sound artist, composer and performer who creates works inspired by discovered sonic textures and forms through a practice of listening, field recording and improvisation. Scott designs experimental electronic instruments and software, as well as sound installations and site-specific performance scenarios. He also performs as one half of the laptop electronic duo Evidence with Stefan Moore, and has performed with many other collaborators, both human and non-human, over the years. Through these collaborations, Scott's artistic practice has dealt with an intense consideration of his own lived-in soundscape, and reflections on this sense of place as it relates to environmental, political and personal emotional factors. The very nature of documenting his life and travels through sound has caused him to reflect intensely on the content and form of these sounds. So many are laced with high-density noise associated with the technologies of our lives. Indeed, hiss and hum are everywhere. Okay, um, so I think we're, we're back, uh, and I also just wanted to uh, thank everyone for, for joining us, and thank you to all the organizers as well. <gasps> oh. And uh, <laughs> there was an emergency call in here earlier, so there's lots going on. Um, so uh, when Natalie and I started uh, discussing the potential for this panel on art and performance in relation to the conference theme, we really wanted to include artists, researchers, who engage with the idea of ecology or sustainable research uh, in very diverse, perhaps even unexpected ways. And so we are hoping to bring together scholars and artists uh, who might offer unthought ways of un approaching sustainable research, ways that extend beyond progressive uh, technological and economic paradigms to dilate what we mean when we talk about research in the first place. Um, and so with those things in mind, we, we came up with a couple of questions that we posed to the artists. Uh, so we thought we would share those with, with everyone and then we'll see what uh, our respondents have to say. Uh, so I was really thinking about the question of sustainability. This conference, the main theme is this question of, of sustainability and what that looks like, especially in academic practice or in research. Um, so I was thinking a lot about that and kind of came up with, with some thoughts. Uh, starting with the idea that sustainability is kind of a catchword, a catchword du jour. Um, and although it is defined in various ways, it is most often understood as a practice or way of doing things that can be maintained or sustained at a certain level indefinitely. In light of anthropogenic climate change, for instance, when we talk about ecological sustainability, we typically still understand it in terms of a battle between nature and human-made interventions like industry, where we as humans are able to sustain nature as we prefer it. That is, we preserve the resources and practices needed for human consumption, whether that means energy consumption or even aesthetic consumption. In this way, it might be argued that sustainability is undergirded by the often unquestioned un imperative for progress and continual growth, in spite of the growing realization that that planet on which we reside is indeed finite. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, uh, I was thinking about, you know, when we talk about sustainability, what is it that we hope to sustain? And that's really the big question that I have. What are we hoping to sustain? And further, how might we redefine and reimagine sustainability beyond anthropocentric desires or desires for us, you know, for humans, towards more livable futures for all? Further, what role might art and performance play in such reimaginings? Mm -hmm. So I stepped in um, kind of on the shoulders of Jesse's question and um, started off with a prompt for our artists. And what I said was, there is no longer any question in the popular imaginary of most that human-induced climate change is real and will continue to impact our lives to a greater and greater degree. In this context, many artists and scholars have been asking, in addition to political activism and research into alternative technological and ecological and economic models, 
What artistic approaches and sensibilities can offer debates surrounding anthropogenic climate change? So rather than providing more information on the Anthropocene, though that is necessary, or new representations of the Anthropocene, which is also useful, um, I wanted to ask, bring attention to a set of artists who, inspired by movements in contemporary art towards the relational, the dialogic, the research-based, and the pedagogical, um, these artists who have instead prioritized the social and interventionist not only as aesthetic, but as ecological form. So what I asked the artists to respond to is, in their practice, whether they make a distinction between art that is on ecological topics and art that takes ecological form. And if they do make that distinction, how they make the distinction, how they navigate that distinction, whether it matters or not. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so we have six artists joining us today that we saw the uh, intro for just uh, briefly. Mm -hmm. And we're actually going to be starting with an artist uh, named Karen Bollander, who is going to join us more as a specter today. Um, and so Natalie is going to be reading a text on her behalf as we also watch a video that Karen prepared uh, to kind of give us a, a further taste of her mm -hmm. practice. Yeah. I am excited to be here today in spectral form and grateful to Natalie and Jesse for inviting me to participate from the periphery. My rural internet connection is too slow to beam me live. Even so, from the small ass farm where I live with a multi-species family in the US Pacific Northwest, I'm excited to share a short video which illustrates certain ways that the Rural Alchemy Workshop, or RAW, practices and practices and explores questions posed in today's panel. Borrowing Donna Haraway's loaded question, whom and what do I touch when I touch my dog? This barnyard-bound performance practice for the past 16 years has investigated the question, who and what do I kiss when I kiss my ass? <laughs> With the caveat that one's ass is never what one thinks it is. And of course, the gift of this question resides in the fact that there is no one simple or respectful way to answer it as such. What matters is the practice of asking it over and over again in loving respect, humble wonder, slow deliberation, and in every way imaginable, and then some. Grounded in webs of care, desire, uncertainty, and fraught complexities of cross-species intimacies, the video illustrates aspects of the raw practice I draw from to address important questions posed by this wonderful panel, beginning with, what is it that we hope to sustain? As I was pondering this question in the context of today's discussion, the final passage from Cormac McCarthy's post-apocalyptic novel, The Road, came to mind. Actually, the last word, which is mystery. In case you haven't read it or don't remember it exactly, the passage goes like this. Once there were brook trout in the streams in the mountains. You could see them standing in the amber current where the white edges of their fins wimpled softly in the flow. They smelled of moss in your hand, polished and muscular and torsional. On their backs were vermiculate patterns that were maps of the world in its becoming, maps and mazes of a thing which could not be put back not be made right again. In the deep glens where they lived, all things were older than man, and they hummed of mystery. The sense of what the earth has lost because of human extractions and overblown hungers is profound and gut-wrenching, but also, in the midst of this stark evocation of loss, I find shimmers of hope in the last line, the last word, because the mystery, old as it is, is always here. So if I had to narrow my response to a word, what do I want my practice and worldly actions to sustain, what I call up is this, mystery. We are aware of devastated practices and devastated earthly places where untold lives have been plundered and erased or pushed to the edges of extinction by human activities and effluence. 
But even in these places, mystery survives because enmeshed in lives are always full and untold stories and unreckoned possibilities. Reckoning with the so-called Anthropocene demands a humility in a variety of forms. Art provides vital tools for honoring what we cannot know by empirical means or grasp at all. Embracing indeterminacy, performance in particular, makes spaces in which to cultivate humility and various kinds of joyful unknowing and passionate wonder. By the same token, such spaces may actively resist dominant and often devastating assumptions of growth and progress. Alongside more overtly political forms of resistance, artful openings allow us to slowly but steadily reimagine becomings within subtle meshes of mystery, maps and mazes where we wander and invite others to wander with us, following nameless passions and tracing hopes for lively futures full of mysterious mud and microbes and mammals and untold others. I am immensely grateful to all of those artists, critics, and others who have cultivated practical spaces that allow artists to fully embody, explore, and live messily inside the frames of our deepest questions, quandaries, and passions. Guided by these practices and theories, I can both creatively and critically dwell inside of what Natalie calls ecologies of care in the raw barnyard. In the logic of art that formally embraces complex interconnection and care in order to do purposeful and responsible imagining within specific nature cultures, it's all ecological. I most admire situated but widely expansive art practices that resonate with Deborah Bird Rose's observation that ecologies may not just be more complex than we think they are, quote, they may be more complex than we can think, end quote. I would call the Rural Alchemy Workshop an ecological art practice, not because it considers multi-species matters, but rather because more than anything else, it questions the wisdom and value of making certain distinctions between forms of life versus the value of sustained attention to interdependencies. Creative practices seek and often find ways of new thinking and perceiving. What is most exciting to me is when we find unforeseen modes of becoming right in our own backyards, in our own entangled bodies and beloved muzzle tongues. Thank you all. From Karen Bolander. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, okay. so yeah, I think our next, uh, our next respondents are coming to us from Chicago today. Um, so we're going to pass it over to uh, Krista Donner, who will then be followed by Andrew Yang. Mm -hmm. So that's a tough act to follow. I'm not going to be quite as poetic as Karen, but um, I'm a very pragmatic kind of, um, but I don't know. I don't know what kind of speaker I am. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to answer both of these questions briefly and, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so in terms of defining sustainability, uh, I don't know. I'm hoping that we can find ways to sustain life with as little fear and suffering as possible. <laughs> um, I mean this in the sense of interconnected ecosystems, but the human part of any ecosystem obviously complicates things because humans tend to be a pretty aggressive and invasive species. Um, so what a lot of humans seem to mean when they talk about sustainability is designing newer and better products that allow us to stay on course with our current anthropocentric and consumer driven trajectory. Uh, that's cool, but I don't think that's a very sustainable goal longer term. Uh, for a lot of humans, this way of thinking, though, is, is the only thing that we've ever known for many generations. So because of that, it can be really hard to imagine something beyond that, outside of that. And that's where I think art comes in, right? Um, so to move forward, I think that two of our most critical resources are care and creative thinking. Creative thinking is what artists do. And we can play many roles in reimagining and redefining sustainability. Um, a lot of the panelists today are, are making and living this in really interesting and playful ways. Um, if we can visualize many possible futures outside of what we're, what we're sort of stuck in and used to, uh, then, then we can work together with other communities and other disciplines to maybe find steps to get there. 
the care part that I mentioned uh, also connects to your other question about representing ecological content versus a more embodied ecological form. Um, in my own work, I do a lot of I do a lot of painting and drawing. That's really that really is all about representation. Uh, representation as a way to propose speculative systems for human sociality that I that that really look to other organisms for skill sharing and co-evolution and imagining imagining possible futures. Um, I also create spaces for audiences to imagine their own role in these systems through a process of guided visualization. And I move back and forth a lot between this kind of imaginative space and a more social, more social direct work with other people and other organisms. I was thinking about this question of, of um, ecological form, and I think it really extends to my work as a mother and as a college educator, uh, working with themes of care and sensory experience in the classroom. So care work and institutional teaching are not usually things that we consider art. They're really personal and intimate in scale. But I recognize them as part of this larger practice of modeling systems that I hope to see in the world. If I'm involving my daughter in the process of growing and composting things, that's making these processes visible um, and accessible and integrating them into her larger worldview. So I would call that a kind of ecological form. The most directly ecological work that I'm doing right now may be that I'm taking my, my interest in social sculpture and nature-based adventure play into some really practical hands-on work in my community. Um, we've, I've been working with a bunch of people in my, in my area to create a forest play space where even in the middle of a city like Chicago, where there's really, it can be really hard to get access to nature without driving a great distance. Um, in, a, in a nature play space that, that creates an opportunity for future generations to kind of develop an ongoing relationship with nature. And of course, by fostering that kind of relationship, we hope that these really potent um, sensory memories will be created, sticking your hands in the dirt, interacting with a snake or an insect that could lead some of them to become future stewards of the environment um, and so on. So that kind of ecological form really feeds back into my more speculative and studio-based practice and, and vice versa. So I think of that, I don't think of it so much as a distinction, but as a cycle. That's it. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing, Krista. Uh, I think we'll pass it back over uh, to the, the other screen to see uh, what Andrew has to say next. Great. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to show some slides with this. Um, let me see if I can manage to do that with the screen share really quickly. Uh, all right, um, can, you, can you all see some images? Yes. An image, a slide. Yep. Great. <laughs> um, I wanted to take up this question uh, of Natalie's. In your practice, do you make a distinction between art that is on ecological topics and art that takes ecological form? And if so, how do you make and navigate this distinction? So um, I just wanna say, I hope you write a book about this, Natalie. I think it's a really great topic <laughs> um, that could be expanded really greatly. And so um, I just wanna say that in general, uh, often, yes, I think this distinction about on ecological topics and taking ecological form is apparent in my work, although I really wish it weren't. Um, I guess it'd be pointing out the obvious to say that I think, you know, in the broadest sense, art is inherently ecological because it's a practice that has inputs and outputs uh, as well as causes and effects that complexly feed back on each other. You know, <laughs> art is committed to the circulation of ideas and images as well as material and economic resources. And as such art is a system that's inextricably part of an ecosystem where we have these energetic and material exchanges taking place. And so, um, you know, some of my work is both about as well as participating in ecology, but as, as I mentioned, I don't think often enough as I would like. Um, and so you know, I'll start with one example that I think 
is moving towards the kind of work I hope to make more and more, um, but then counterpoint that with the kind of work that I think um, isn't doing as much as it could. <laughs> and so um, in a project like Flying Gardens of Maybe, which I've been doing since um, 2012, material circulation and transformation are really part of both the conceptual and the, the practical core. So in this project, I connect with the ecology of different kinds of um, volunteer groups, like the Chicago Bird Collision Monitors uh, in the city, a group that in the early morning hours goes throughout the city and uh, collects birds that have collided with buildings due to the reflective as well as the transparent nature of window glass that you find all throughout the city. Um, now, I also work with the Bird Lab at the Field Museum of Natural History, where the bird collision monitors bring those birds, and then those fallen birds become part of the museum's archive. But I, I'm not going to the museum's bird lab for the birds, but rather for the plants that are in ecological mutualism with those birds. Because in eating plant fruits, the birds take in their seeds and become, in a way, vehicle by which plants can, can distribute themselves to the landscape. And so uh, the museum throws away the bird stomachs. And so by retrieving these guts um, and then retrieving the seeds from those guts, uh, I can redistribute the seeds orphaned within the fallen birds, either back into bird feeders so that they can continue their journey through the landscape, or in other cases, um, through the throwing of these ceramic pots where the seeds from individual birds can sort of sprout and grow as these sort of gardens as of maybe uh, taking this sort of ecological and visualizable form. So, I mean, in this way, I would, I would argue that at least the project aspires to participating in the rerouting of this sort of ecology of interruptions that happen in all of these different ways between the, the natural and the cultural here, between the birds and the plants, between the thing that seems obvious, like the bird and the thing that's less obvious, but just as important um, with the seeds. Um, and engaging though, importantly also with different kinds of communities. So it's not just about the bird and the plant, but also about these volunteers, but then also the institution of the museum, uh, along with these non-human species. And so trying to find some way to insinuate myself into the flow as a way to you know, reweed ecology as a process. Um, so it's through engaging materials specifically uh, and the mm -hmm. process of movement and transformation that I see this distinction of ecological form as opposed to a work that's just sort of about ecology. So uh, all that said, a lot of what I consider my, my artistic work uh, has nothing to do with ecology as material flow in any obvious way. You know, I write a lot of papers and essays on topics of the Anthropocene um, in various ways, or I might make collages that are quote unquote about the Anthropocene, but really mainly main, uh, circulate in digital form, like they're circulating right now at this very moment uh, across Alberta and everywhere else. And so I recognize to what extent I'm kind of addicted to this cultural system. And I kind of want to find some guidance, I think, through other people's art practices to, to find my way out of this. Um, I mean, on the face of it, digital text, image, and sound is intangible and informational. It seems cybernetic, but not really ecological because it doesn't have any uh, clear material or energetic impact. But of course, every PDF and JPEG really does have this impact, right? Um, the other thing about what I was saying about work that's about ecology but doesn't embrace form is that uh, all of this digital work, I mean, the conversation I'm having now, of course, is also embracing ecological form, but it's screened off. You know, the computer screen screens off all of the cheap electricity generated by nuclear fossil fuel power um, that makes these impacts hidden. You know, I was just thinking about this, like, 2016 study by Lawrence Livermore Laboratories that, that argued that the average American's Internet uh, usage annually produces about 300 pounds of carbon dioxide or about as much as burning 15 gallons of gas or 57 liters of gas would burn. And so it seems like Internet usage doesn't actually have that much of an impact. But if anything is true in the Anthropocene, it's the fact that small increments manifest themselves in these large and looming ways. And the question is, like, how do you make that sort of tangible and visible and physical to oneself? Um, because even though that, that Internet usage in the U.S. only takes up 2 percent of U.S.'s uh, electricity use, that's about the equivalent of the output of like eight nuclear power plants or, or twice of the 
twice the electricity that all the solar panels in the U.S. actually even produce. And so that's why I was kind of interested in this around the world conference model in general, you know, that you actually take into account the energetic materiality, uh, the material flows of things that are, are often screened off in our culture, right? That we don't really take into account um, that academic travel, the conference travel, these things um, remain in the space of the, the non-ecological form of the immaterial. And I think this conference is really important in sort of drawing out um, a real, uh, the real physical and energetic consequences of that kind of um, knowledge making. And so in closing with that too, I just want to say, um, you know, traditionally part of one of the pro prompts and the question was this idea of aesthetic form versus ecological form. And so certainly like traditionally aesthetics is understood to be something about judgments concerning formal properties of artworks, right? Comparison, composition, sense of space, narrative structure. Um, that's all couched of course in art history, art historical comparisons and, and traditions of mediums like painting or, or sculpture. And so in that regard, the aesthetic as we typically use it obviously boils down to kind of connoisseurship. Um, but I'm really interested in art practices that reclaim the word aesthetics to its more truer and etymological roots, right? Which are really about perceived perception and awareness. It really has nothing to do with beauty per se, but about one's understanding um, of themselves in relation to their environment and therefore um, really about embodiment first and foremost. So I think um, <clears throat> the idea of the aesthetic, um, if we can try to open it up and take it more seriously, um, has the capacity to help help us pay more attention not only to art practices, but various social and cultural practices, right, that don't um, operate under the title of art. And that sort of tired distinction between art and non-art, um, art in life, art in science, art in eating, art in therapy, um, which I think is highly problematic. So a lot of the work I'm, I'm trying to do is like really sort of move past art and maybe more towards aesthetics. And um, that's where there are other projects that also might engage this question of form. You know, I, I, I rattled off all those statistics about uh, electricity and, and carbon dioxide and uh, all of those things that are sort of pure abstractions. How can we leverage those abstractions into things that are visualizable and embodied and participatory, not just left in the abstract space of sort of science and policy? Mm -hmm. And so just in close, so, and, <laughs> and I think Karen Bollinger's kind of work, for example, is exactly the kind of thing that I sort of think about when I think about tr something that's truly aesthetic. Um, so I just want to close with this quote, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes by Donna Haraway that I think also addresses this question of form, because I think ecological form <coughs> um, and the question of form is, is a really rich one. So form, like nature, is one of the most complicated words in the English language. Form is about shape, number, figure, beauty, making, ritual, image, order, cause, relationship, kind, conduct, and character. To have good form describes a way of doing something that is at once about ethics, techniques, and practice. And so, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. So many nice. things already. Um, and we still have uh, three more artists yeah. to talk with. So we're gonna pass it over now to Mia Foyer, who is joining us from uh, California, from Oakland, California. Okay, I also have to figure out the screen share. Let's see. What can you see? You can, can, can you see green crystals? No. Uh oh, well no. Hmm. Claire, are you there? <laughs> I'm doing what you told me to do. <laughs> Andrew, what did you do? I clicked the little button at the bottom that yeah. said has the arrow pointing up, uh -huh. and then I went to share applications. But my, my PowerPoint presentation already sort of had to be up, and then I could hit PowerPoint and it went to full screen. You see that little icon with laptop and an arrow? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Or you could just go to share screen instead of trying to click on an application. And if, you're, if your images are up on the screen. Ah. How's that? Yeah. Here we go. Okay. 
And okay. you can play the PowerPoint, Mia, if you want. You can press play, and then it'll go to... Uh... Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. I know I'm cutting into the time frame here. No um, okay. Let me... Yeah, I'm going to play it. Okay. All right. Can you still hear me and everything? Yeah. Everything's okay? Okay. All right. So... Um, Thank you so much for including me in this important and fascinating conversation. Andrew, I really loved what you just said about aesthetics. Um, and then that Donna Haraway uh, excerpt was, was really beautifully put. So um, I just want to spend the next six minutes or so, <clears throat> excuse me, exploring the complex nature of my, pra my practice, which exists somewhere between the intersections of sculptor, activist, mother, and storyteller. So <clears throat> as someone who is relearning how to understand and relate to the materials of her practice and her life, instead of discussing specific works, um, I want to point to specific objects, entanglements, environments, and events that have created ruptures in the trajectory of my sculptural work and inform my minuscule understanding of what my role, uh, what my sculpture might play in the reimagining of a more livable future for humans and non-human entities. So um, I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle than what we've seen so far, but bear with me. So the first image is um, an image of uh, polyester resin cast emeralds. Um, the first time I ever saw something like this, I was six years old volunteering backstage at a local theater company. and. Uh, they were working on the set for Oz, for, for the Emerald City. And uh, of course, I was mystified by these humans who were making crystals out of petrochemicals. <laughs> Second image, this is um, uh, my love affair with the uh, microorganisms that live on my dad's hockey, go my, my dad's yeah. goalie pads. Mia, yeah. um, can I interrupt you? Yeah. So we're, yeah. Not see we're not seeing the PowerPoint play. We're still on the crystal. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so I think you have to okay, I just minimized it. Yeah. I just min minimized it. Is that better? Yeah. Can you guys kind of, can, can, yeah. I have no idea what you're looking at. It's okay? All right, cool. Yeah. Okay, second image. Let me just start again. Second image, um, the love I have for the smell of the microorganisms that live on my dad's goalie equipment. Right. The soggy cardboard boxes that I collected with a bunch of Palestinian kids in Hebron. And brought it through an Israeli checkpoint in order to build a puppet theater, an onion, and the way that the onion is uh, functions as a neutralizer of tear gas. Um, beneath my storage space, which swallowed 80 paper mache donkeys. <clears throat> a steel bridge originally built in England in 1901 that was meant to cross the Nile River that ended up in Winnipeg crossing a train yard. The upside down birch trees that were installed in a reclamation site on the Suncor Energy um, mining grounds. The global seed vault in Svalbard in Longyearbyen. A roll of tar paper that I found um, in Longyearbyen while I was participating in an arts and science residency uh, sailing the Arctic. And the dog sled that I made out of the tar paper and other bits of petroleum trash that washed up on the shores of Arctic fjords. And the sea ice that would float by and the turquoise glow that would emanate from the sea ice, our captain would tell us that the more ancient the sea ice, the more brilliant it would glow turquoise. And a 3D model, excuse me, a 3D model that I made um, uh, off the coast of Louisiana in Bayou Point of Chen uh, while working with um, the federally unrecognized uh, Indian tribe of the Biloxi Chittimata Chakta, who, uh, whose land is sinking into uh, or being swallowed by the Gulf of Mexico due to sea level rise. This piece of land that I captured is now underwater. Um, <clears throat> and an image of a 3D model of the uh, notosaur, which was discovered in 2011 in the Suncor Energy um, 
tar pits while a miner noticed a diamond pattern in his um, in his shovel while he was digging into the muck. Um, and what is really interesting to me about what, what I'm fascinated by by this this image is the fact that the museum will not release the 3D model of this uh, of this specimen to me because they don't want it represented in an artwork, which I think is really puzzling. The microbiome of mealworms and how they're able to digest styrofoam. The jewel vault uh, in the basement of the Federal Bank of Tehran. The number 402. So in 2016, um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere exceeded 402 parts per million. And that was also the same year my baby was born. And this is my baby who is as obsessed and fascinated with the Anthropocene as I am. <laughs> and this is the machine that I employed made out of metal and plastic to terminate my second pregnancy. And the machine that lives inside of me made out of metal and plastic that creates a hostile environment for sperm and polyester resin that I use all the time in my art making, which creates toxic fumes in the air. And while I was using it every day just recently, um, creating toxic fumes in the immediate air around my house, um, the air in the entire region was unbreathable due to the unprecedented wildfires in Napa County, Napa Valley and Sonoma County. And um, this is a piece that I made out of all of that uh, polyester resin that I've been casting. Um, it's called Totems, Totems of the Anthropocene and um, <clears throat> other materials besides the polyester resin include found vessels that formerly contained petroleum and found sleds. And uh, I guess I'm just gonna close with this final image, uh, which is also my first image um, that I guess bookends my 30 year uh, fascination uh, with petrochemicals used in my artistic practice. Um, they initially seduced me and have led me on a 30 year sculptural trajectory fraught with conflict, contradiction, carcinogenic fumes, alchemy and wonder. So, um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So, yeah. is, uh, I'm, I'm finding this format really interesting because in normal conference spaces, we actually acknowledge each speaker. And then the clapping also yeah. not only gives us a chance to say thank you, but it gives a chance for the kind of scene to be reset as the next person steps up. Yeah. Um, so now I, I've done that with my voice. <laughs> and then we'll pass over to Leanne. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I am replying to question one. Um, so in that question, uh, we're thinking about sustainability as maintaining um, as a way of, to me that means staying the same and that allure of timelessness that I think is sold <laughs> so much in the world. Um, and so what I'm finding is that yet what's happening in every moment is change aging, adjustment, adaptation. Um, but I think these are narratives that are uh, neglected as they don't sell. So I'm just going to start moving my slides. Okay. So um, right now I'm at the Edmonton Waste Management site as an artist in residence. And I think what I'm seeing are these skins of consumption and the other half of the life cycle of these products of these promises that are on the shelves. Um, also finding uh, slogans uh, tucked in away amongst these magic black bags. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and I think in these slogans, there, there's these promises, these encouragements to kind of to stay the same and also to, stay, to save, save money. Um, and yeah, so I've been thinking about about these intersecting worlds of these these magic bags that are taken away to this site and thinking about the landfill um, as this airport almost where the materials arrive um, and then they go on to their next destination. Uh, recycling, landfill, computer, like the GEEP uh, electronic plant. So, and thinking about that moment um, like in an airport where you can just magically kind of switch time zones and 
tra uh, that that sort of fantasticness that travel can provide. Um, so when thinking about these as disconnections um, and as abilities to transcend these illusions. So in my, I guess in my reimagining of sustainability, I'm trying to not imagine, <laughs> but to see it as it is, uh, to see massive change, uh, to see impermanence, and to see loss as an everyday occurrence, to see loss as the norm, and finding a familiarity in uh, this upheaval. Um, and I think the issue with that is that it challenges um, it challenges the need for soothing consumption, which can kind of provide um, this idea that everything is timeless and will last forever. Um, so I'm thinking with, with finding familiarity with upheaval and with loss, um, that, I guess that's what I'm trying to get comfortable with in my practice. <laughs> and, uh, and then in thinking about that, I'm thinking, well, that is not actually, maybe that's not very sustainable because it would not uh, soothe the need of consumption. <laughs> if, if everyone was okay with decay and change, then maybe we wouldn't need to consume as much. So that is my quick presentation. <laughs> oh yeah, we can laugh at that live. Okay. Everyone else can laugh too. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I think we have one final respondent who's going to do something a little bit different, um, who's also on site here in Edmonton. Yeah, and so we'll scoot over a little bit. Okay, thanks. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank um, uh, Jesse and everyone for putting this together and inviting me to be part of this. I'm honored to be sharing this with all the other artists who just said fascinating things. I'm not going to say hardly anything. I'm going to take about 30 seconds to tell you what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to do it, hopefully. Uh, I'm also going to set a timer, because I will get lost in this, ultimately. So um, some of the uh, research uh, that I've been working on in the last few years is uh, looking at solar power, uh, making solar powered um, devices. Um, this is uh, a solar powered instrument. Uh, oh, you see up there. Um, I call it Orange Crush, which is a really stupid name. So. Um, uh, it, this is a batteryless um, electronic musical instrument, um, so it's totally powered from this solar panel here on the back. Um, now, I'm inside, so I can't really play this, um, uh, except I can, because this one um, has a supercapacitor inside of it. Um, so you can kind of think of that, um, you might sort of think of this in terms of a metaphor as sort of like a bagpipe. <laughs> so it's got some energy, it's been holding up, I, I charged it today in, in the windowsill. Um, and it'll probably play for about 10 minutes um, before it dies. Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna, of course, I'll go for six minutes. My alarm will go off. Um, it, might, it might die before that, who knows. So here we go. Um, uh, this is a lo-fi performance, um, and it's gonna spout, it's probably sound especially lo-fi to uh, those uh, online, so we'll just see what happens here.
<laughs> so you need to tell us how it works. What is it that you are doing here? It's magic. <laughs> History. So, so yeah, um, I'll, I'll just say it briefly, and then you know yeah. during the discussion, if more questions come up about it, uh, this instrument is is just it's a little synthesizer. Um, it's designed. Um, using logic circuits, um, uh, basically hex Schmidt trigger circuits um, that basically produce square waves. Um, and what I've got, it, it, I think this one has six oscillators, um, and they're controlled by these touch keys. So uh, I have four available here, two of which have frequencies that are controlled by these little photo sensors here. So the basically the amount of light in the room, and the other two are controlled by these knobs here. So those four oscillators are what I can control from these touch sensors. And depending on how I press, um, I'm also obviously kind of covering up the photo cell, so I'm doing a lot of different things with my hands, and I'm mostly just feeling and trying to make really small micro movements in order to, um, in this case, I was creating something that was somewhat drony, I guess. Um, there's another oscillator here that I played with my nose, uh, just for fun. Okay. And then there's another one up here that kind of sets up, a, uh, I didn't really use this very much, I turned it on at the very end, but it's, it creates a really low frequency, mostly a kind of a rhythmic frequency that also pulsates through the system. Um, and that's basically it. There's a volume knob, there's a power switch, and uh, there's also two blue LEDs that light up here when, when the device is fully charged. So you can see I've already, I've already dissipated it down so that those are no longer um, uh, lit. Uh, it actually, it's still working, but it's getting, it's slowly, the charge is slowly going down. The supercapacitors that charge this are not like batteries because they dissipate um, linearly. The, the voltage actually goes down like this instead of like this with the battery. So there's a lot of challenges to using them. Uh, but, uh, and obviously they don't last as long as batteries in terms of the amount of power that they hold, but they last longer than batteries in terms of their ecological uh, uh, life, I suppose. Uh, the, this, this device hopefully will, will last for as long, at least my lifetime, if not longer, um, without ever having to have uh, any work done on it at all. So. Um, anyway, okay, thank you. That. Sure. Yeah, um, so we do want to open up to kind of questions and roundtable discussion from folks in the room, folks around the world, um, and yeah, good. And I guess uh, maybe I'll start by just pointing out a few, and I don't know if you want to as well, a few of the kind of themes that. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, thank you, all of you. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, it was a really rich um, and interesting set of interconnecting. Um, presentations and some of some of the things that I kind of pulled out um, that kind of echo through many of the presentations include this distinction between um, that Krista brought up kind of cycling through between representation and this is how I wrote it not not your words Krista you can um, reframe in your own words but between representation as a, a mode of showing that proposes speculative futures or speculative alternatives or systems, um, and the value of that um, way of thinking through representation and cycling between that and a kind of a modeling or an embodying process that you link to care work, um, care work located in the home, maternal care work, um, family care work, uh, and also institutional labor and the, the care work that we do in the teaching institutions that we inhabit. Um, and so the value also of modeling systems, and these are your words, that we hope to see in the world, or maybe they're not your words, but I wrote them down from what you said. Right, so this kind of, this kind of distinction um, is one that I heard echoing across many of the, um, the conversations. And then also, um, Andrew then picked this up with this distinction about visibility, right? Um, and there, you know, thinking about ecology as material flow and um, the digital and the kind of the cybernetic as something that we try and that we often are kind of, uh, it's often framed as immaterial, right? But that is clearly material. And the frame um, that kind of renders invisible all of the kind of the labor um, and the, the sort of resources and the ecological kind of effects um, that it takes to allow for this digital kind of, um, life to be lived, right? So they are also how art can bring kind of modes of visibility and attention to things that are often kind of rendered invisible, right? 
Um, and that is something that also is picked up in both Mia and Leanne's work, mm -hmm. right? So, um, which I kind of this, the, um, I hope that you don't take this the wrong way, but I kind of, I wrote down them upcycling, mm -hmm. right? Because there's, a, there's a, an interest in found objects, right? And in the detritus of the Anthropocene in both of your works. Um, and in different ways, one through photography and one through sculpture, right? Um, grabbing these objects, bringing them into visibility and bringing new forms of value. Um, both to them as objects that circulate in this thing we call the art world, um, but also as kind of invitations to think through um, the detritus and the labor um, and the, uh, the kind of the excesses that are gathering around and um, and that are a result um, of the, kind of the petro-capitalist system that um, has kind of been the dominant system over the past at least you know hundred years, right? Um, we can argue about the beginning, right? So, so the, these kinds of um, themes, um, weaving through all of them, and then this last theme that I see kind of between um, Leanne, uh, Mia, and Scott, uh, in terms of the, the pull of objects, that also brings us back to Andrew's call for us to think through a thesis, right, in its um, a link to awareness and perception, but through that, it's not just awareness and perception, but in, of course, the material body, right, through which we perceive, right, um, through which we access a world. Um, and so these, this pull of these objects, and both the pull of the objects in the Waste Management Center, and of course, we can talk about you, Kelly's work, and the, the wonderful ways in which you're asking us to think about maintenance work and labor and care. Um, and then this object that you brought in here, where I thought at first, is this like a theremin? What's happening? Why is he putting his face down mm -hmm. and up? What's it responding to, right? Um, but this like, object that talks back, right, that's dancing with your body. Um, and then, of course, kind of smell. It was Mia who brought up smell, um, you know, the pull of smell, like the pull of sound, right? So in that, you know, there's also a kind of theme I see running through that has to do with kind of thinking about not to, um, not to say that ocular centrism and uh, visualization techniques and the visual um, should be rejected, but in thinking through ecological form and sensory perception, being attentive to the relationship between ocular centrism and consumer capitalism, petrocultural, colonial um, world orders, right? Because the visible, right, and the kind of the language of perspectival distance that is attached to the visible and especially is dominant in this world that we all inhabit called the art world, right? Um, there's something there that I see each of you questioning and challenging and playing with, um, but maybe that's just my bias, so I'll pass it over to you. Yeah. yeah, well, I don't know if anyone wants to respond to any of those thoughts or things that you noticed in those patterns that Natalie identified or any other thoughts on those, those things to start. Any of our panelists from afar? Oh, Mia's talking. Mia, Mia, Mia has one. Oh, but we can't hear her there. <laughs> yeah, I, Natalie, I thought that um, that, was a, that was a really beautifully quiet response. Can you hear me okay? I can kind of hear myself. I'm going to turn back to um, Yeah, the, but yeah, thank you for sort of just uh, summarizing um, so eloquent, uh, eloquently. Yeah, I, yeah I, I agree with a lot of what you just said. <laughs> I guess, well, I can, I can build on that or ask a question in relation to that, because I also wrote down uh, this question of visibility and invisibility. And I, and I heard a lot of people talking, especially in response to the question of form, um, kind of poking around or trying to navigate this question of representation, which I think is a question in, in terms of the Anthropocene or climate change or sustainability, is like, how do we represent these things? And I think that's a challenge that a lot of people are trying to kind of work through. People talk about it differently. Um, Tim Morton talks about this idea that climate change, for instance, is, is a hyper object. It's so big, so it's really hard for us to understand, let alone represent. And I know Mia has kind of drawn on that, that kind of concept before as well. Um, and there's other people, including scientists and, and kind of social scientists, who note that even with more and more statistics that tell us you know, about the impacts of climate change right now, let alone into the future, um, people still don't kind of respond to that in terms of kind of a representation of what's going on. And then there's also the whole kind of like denial of climate change. Mm -hmm. But Bruno Latour would argue that, you know, maybe we're all climate change deniers in some way because it really is hard for us to fathom the, the scale of these things. 
And so the question of representation for me is super interesting and one that I think artists are really trying to kind of struggle through uh, and with and this question of like instead of representing these, these, these impending or kind of convergence of crises, bringing awareness to them or bringing an embodied kind of awareness to them or kind of dilating what we're able to perceive in the first place, which I think is what Andrew was kind of pointing to. Uh, so that's how I was thinking about this idea of invisibility and visibility is like can art offer this kind of yeah dilation of what's even possible to be thought and Karen Bollander kind of quoted that as well this idea of like maybe we can't even think these things yet maybe we need new conceptual aesthetic tools to even be able to think uh, think about that um, so that was something I thought it would be interesting to, to hear from people is this question of like how do we visualize or make make um, uh, so that we can register some of these these impasses, and I think you're all doing it in different different ways. Like this idea of the other side of the promise, which I love, the promise of consumption, and then the other side of it, which is invisibilized in the magic black bags. Or Andrew speaking about the the kind of uh, material, uh, you know, like Natalie pointed to the material kind of ecologies around even digital um, digital kind of interactions. So yeah, I was thinking about that visibility, invisibility question, and sound is another kind of avenue there. So I don't know if anyone had any thoughts or tangents about that question of visibilizing, invisibilizing uh, some of these things. I think I would jump in there. I mean, I think that's something that I, that I am really wrestling with right now because I'm, I'm, my background is as a visual artist and I am really invested in painting and drawing and, and Making things visible that we can't that we can't access, but um, but I also have found lately that you know I, I think I've I've, um, I've been teaching this class on the five senses for several years in creative research, and I've I've gotten really interested in the um, you know, what happens when you when you open spaces maybe through sound or through um, touch through the other senses through smell how those things can activate really potent memories and kind of um, allow people to make their own visualizations. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can sometimes be more, I don't know, I'm not going to stop drawing anytime soon, but mm -hmm. I think that can, um, that could really be a, a powerful way into, uh, into sort of changing systems that we operate in is to, is to encourage people or, or create uh, structures so that people are doing their own visualizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I would say also, um, if it's okay, I also, I, I'm teaching, as you were talking, I was just thinking about this class I'm teaching digital tools for sculptors and the way that we're using 3D scanners and talking about how to uh, digitally preserve things that are disappearing. Um, in one of my slides was a chunk of land that is now underwater forever gone, but I have this like weird 3D model of it that exists and what does that mean and who owns it also mm -hmm. like that is that land was owned, you know, that is that ancestral land to the uh, point of in, you know, Indian tribe and yet I'm sitting here with the 3D model of it. Mm -hmm. um, these are just questions and, and I don't and I don't have any answers, but it's I don't know, and maybe that was a tangent, <laughs> but I, it got, it got me. Maybe, maybe, you know, I, I don't know a lot about the project, but what struck me about that, that project and you recreating this model is that um, maybe going back to the Natalie's, or both Jesse and Natalie's ideas, like, yeah, this, I mean, I, I, I sometimes wonder, worry about the, the visible, invisible itself is also being this sort of oppositional thing. When, thing that's in interesting about the object you're creating is it's like it's quantitative it's of this scanned abstract space but then you make it this qualitative thing that actually fits it potentially sounds like in the palm of one's hand right it's sort of reduced into an embodied scale i don't know well in, in in the project that it ended up being part of we actually made it full full size it was only about yeah it was like about a five foot chunk, chunk. of land yeah <laughs> Um, but it can be scaled to, to fit in the palm of my hand. <laughs> you know? so, I, mean, I guess I, I was just thinking, you know, about, I've been thinking about this yeah. idea about, um, you know, Thomas Nagel, the philosopher, has this idea of the view from nowhere. And the view from nowhere is sort of the scientific view. And I think that a, a film like the Charles and Ray Eames' Powers of Ten really embodies that sort of visibility 
fixation on the visible. And you can you can go to the utter scale of outside of the galaxy to you know to the subatomic scale. But I think what's so interesting if you watch Powers of Ten is it starts at this couple picnicking in the in Grant Park in Chicago, but it either goes away from them or it, it zooms into them. You never spend any time with the couple in Grant Park mm-hmm. and the lawn, like all of this thing about what we consider the subjective, uh, subjective embodied experience is like erased and is made invisible for the sake of these different kinds of visibilities. And so I, I sometimes have been trying to think through this idea of like the view from nowhere sensibility as opposed to the view from now here, which might be like the subjective, the embodied, maybe the less ocular optical um, thing. And, and how do you, how do you, hybridize them or synthesize them because I think they themselves are often played in opposition to each other. Like, oh, there's the intuitive, there's the intelligent, there's the qualitative, there's the quantitative. And I'm thinking about like, what is the, like in the Anthropocene, uh, maybe ecological form is, a, is another way to say forms of complexity that like sort of d- don't just exceed our ability to understand them in terms of physical size, but also complexity, right? And so what I think with your projects, Mia, and I think uh, with the projects of, of Karen Bolander and these other photographs that Leanne's doing, I mean, I think what's interesting to me is like, could they represent or how, how do those, how could those develop into something that one could think of as like the aesthetics of the middle? <laughs> you oh, know, okay, yeah. isn't, just, isn't just about the now, the nowhere, the now here, but the, the entangled mixture of them mm-hmm. and, and, and just embo- uh, embracing the fact that all of our knowledge is partial and, and making sense of that without diminishing it into some space of the partial being completely the personal, right, the emotional, uh, the whatever, that, that the quantitative and the qualitative aspects can like sort of live together in, in some sort of aesthetic frame as opposed to always be sort of um, put in opposition to each other. And so that's where I'm, that's kind of one of the thoughts I have for that is that it's like aesthetics of the middle that gets at that complexity. Yeah. Still, yeah. 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 I'll jump in and say yeah. something about the the sort of invisibility, visible, invisible. Um, so uh, there's a I I can't remember exactly what the what the quote is, but uh, it's a famous Armory Schaefer quote. I hopefully everybody knows who that is. He's a, um, a Canadian um, theorist and composer who. Uh, uh, was the first person to theorize and write about soundscape as a concept. I think he may have even coined the term. But um, anyway, um, so I'm someone who does a lot of field recording, a lot of listening um, in my work. And uh, I remember reading this passage, um, uh, which was something along the lines of, uh, I had a student, this is Armory Schaefer talking, I had a student once who played me a recording of a beautiful bird song um, and he was so proud of himself that he created this great recording. Um, and I asked him, what kind of bird is that? And the student said, I don't actually know. <laughs> and Armory Schaefer said, well, you should know, because the birds are proud of their voices. You should know about the bird that's making the sound. Um, and I, I was really moved by that when I read it, uh, and it reminded me of an experience I had um, it was a long time ago now, but I think one of the things that planted the seed uh, in terms of being a bit concerned about the noise of, of kind of humanity and, and our, our technology, I looked out the window and I saw, um, I was in Baltimore, I think, and I saw a crow on a telephone wire and I couldn't hear the crow, but I could see that it was trying to make sound. And I could see it really closely. I had a really good view of it and the crow was just going, like you could see like the tension in its muscles. It was, it was trying so hard to make this sound. And I went outside then and, and sure enough, of course it was just loud Baltimore and this crow was just trying to speak over the noise. And it was the first time I think I'd ever had the kind of empathy <laughs> for, for, for crows and animals in general and, and their, their, the difficulty in sounding their voices. Um, so I just wanted to say that that was just a little a little moment of, of clarity mm-hmm. for me, and I, I think the result of that is um, uh, I think it was uh, Karen in her the first presentation talking about this idea of mystery, 
um, which is, is really spoke to me. Um, I, I, th I use the term evidence, which is a, a name we've actually given a duo of mine uh, with, with Stefan Moore. We make, we make music with field recordings, and we think a lot about our experience listening and discovering and finding sounds and, and thinking about what those sounds mean. Sometimes we think in terms of evidence, evidence for something miraculous and mysterious that's happening. Um, and the st there's so much in that sound uh, that, that tells a story, but also just provides a lot of open questions. Um, so anyway, that's a long-winded, that's just a bunch of stuff, so. <laughs> We have an audience question, but I don't yeah, know if Leanne good. wants to respond first to um, that. I, just, I guess, yeah, a couple of thoughts. Just thinking about the aesthetics of the middle. Um, at the Waste site, I've been just looking at how everything is formed there. So everything is a pile. So everything is a triangle. <laughs> and there's so much beauty in this structure. Maybe beauty is not the right word. But just I've just been mesmerized by the structure of all the materials and how they kind of stay together. And uh, the middle is the place, <laughs> the safest place in the pile. Mm -hmm. um, but then thinking about at the top of the pile, like every day, um, I'm gonna go back to some of my images here, because they're here. Mm -hmm. um, every day this pile that is, uh, it's called a tip floor, where all the materials land, it's, it goes, it's every day it's, it's taken away, it's, it's removed. Um, but the top of the pile is the most unstable place. So I've been thinking about that in terms of, um, of progress and growth and how we're always trying to go up, but then once you get up there, it doesn't last. <laughs> so mm -hmm. every day just watching the pile fall from the top and fall, all the materials come down, but the middle kind of stays the same. Mm -hmm. um, and then also thinking about what Mia was talking about, um, about care. So I guess sometimes I think with these long photo projects that I'm doing that maybe it's, it is a mode of care of being with these subjects or these um, environments that are changed or sort of ignored um, and spending time with the, their life cycle, <laughs> their other half of the life cycle that, that's not as, uh, I guess, I would aesthetically pleasing. So um, yes, yeah, so I've just been thinking about that. Am I caring <laughs> for all of these objects or places? Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I feel, yeah, I think I'm trying to have empathy, maybe have mm -hmm. empathy for what what this end of life cycle is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. just some thoughts. <laughs> I think it's a perfect, perfect segue into the question. Yeah, yeah actually, okay. the, yeah. on the, the question of um, kind of the tip floor, was it called? Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and this kind of idea of growth, which mm -hmm. I know we brought up several times throughout the, the presentation. I think it's, we have a really um, interesting question here from Howard Nye, uh, and I'll just kind of paraphrase it a little bit, but uh, they point to the idea that various participants have suggested, and including Natalie and I, that an important objective of ecological advocacy today should be the acceptance of a future without economic growth. And I would probably say that hopefully we were a bit more nuanced than that, but we were definitely poking at this idea of, of, of the imperative for growth or the seeming imperative for growth uh, that's kind of undergirding this so-called Anthropocene. Um, so the worry here from this, this respondent is that uh, this may involve a conflation between, on the first hand, uh, economic growth that involves a great deal of environmental destruction, which we currently have, and on the other hand, economic growth per se, which could in principle occur with drastically less environmental destruction. Mm -hmm. So I think the question is, is it economic growth you know, per se that is the problem, or is it economic growth related to this kind of extractivist environmental uh, destructive practices? I have lots of things to say about this, but I'd rather uh, start by opening it up to, um, I don't know, respondents, this question of growth, progress as it relates to economics, capitalism, um, we could talk about that as well. Anyone want to dive in first? I'll start. Um, yeah, I, sometimes I think about this in terms of, rather than thinking about <clears throat> growth, which always has seemed, ever since I was a little kid, the idea of growth has always seemed like the wrong thing to be striving for. Because in my little kid brain, <clears throat> all I could think of is, well, eventually it's going to be too big. <laughs> and so I never could get that concept. I, I tend to think of it more along the lines of, of trying to wrap up a really important project. Um, and I hate, to be, I, I hate to be a downer, um, but I, I do tend to think, um, and I think I'm on pretty strong ground here, that the Earth is probably not going to last forever. There seems to be quite a bit of evidence to support that at this point. So we do have an end game somewhere um, in the future. And I think, um, it, I think that the, the climate deniers are correct 
when they say, um, it, with those of them who say these sorts of things, uh, that, uh, well, we're all going to die anyway, so what does it matter? We might as well just like sort of enjoy the, the profit, the, the, the spoils of this planet until either uh, the God comes and saves us, whoever that God is, or, uh, or something else happens, which no one seems to know what that something else is going to be. So I, whatever, th there is a long game uh, that I think uh, a, a responsible way to think about it is, is just winding down humanity in a, in a responsible way that also leaves room for whatever is gonna be replacing us <laughs> or whatever is left here. Um, some of that comes, I think, from experiences I've had um, working uh, with um, dead or dying artists um, and, and actually going through their legacy and preparing the materials uh, that live beyond them. Things that we all think about as artists, as even, even when we don't like thinking about them or we, didn't, we don't want to admit that we think about it, but uh, I think about that a lot more now having had that experience uh, of caring for someone who's about to die and making uh, very difficult decisions with that person and that person's family about what, what ephemeral things from that person's life need to be preserved and what don't and what good does it do anyone anyway. <laughs> and so I think a lot about that and I'm starting to think that maybe like the human project is something uh, that, that we need to think about in that way. Uh, I don't know what that means, but that's, those are my, that's my first and half. Uh, respond, or, uh, Krista or, or Mia or Andrew, any want to add in at this point, or it's okay if not, we can. I think that's a, I think that's a fair observation. You know, I, I think that the question is um, isn't about just growth in any and any sort of absolute terms, but I think it has to do with with tempo, right, and pace. I mean, when something grows, uh, when something grows, it's often the pace of growth is matched by the pace of, right, um, death or recycling of materials. But the, the, yeah, the extractivist model of growth is, is really one that sort of is at a tempo that outstrips its, its resources without replenishing those. I mean, eventually all of the plastics and stuff we're burying in landfills right now will, you know, probably become coal and oil, but you'd have to wait several hundreds of millions of years, you know? And so that's the thing. It's like, we've, it took hundreds of millions of years to produce those petro, uh, the, the petroleum and, and the coals, and we burned through it in 200 years with, with no gesture to think about how to sustain, back to Jesse's question, you know, sustain a growth that's cyclical. And that growth uh, is about maintaining, uh, right, the, the collective body as it were, that, that takes into account the fact that things die back and other things mm -hmm. grow in its place in a sort of uh, ecology of things that, that isn't just about sort of uh, this very linear uh, waste economy. The extractive economy is all about the waste economy. It doesn't take into account what Leanne said, which is that we should embrace decay. Mm -hmm. right? The decay is the thing that's regenerating the materials from which things can, can grow in the future, but we don't treat anything like that. We treat it purely as waste. Mm -hmm. So. I agree with them. It's not completely about growth, but it's become synonymous. Extractive, you know, extractive capitalism has become a synonymous with the way we think about growth today. But it's a weird kind of growth. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really difficult. You know, I'm not necessarily suggesting that we do away with all. I don't know. Maybe I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's really difficult to. I think it's really, it's really hard to imagine a how. Uh, we can break out of these systems of sort of ex extractive growth economies um, when we're working with them. Like, like capitalism is sort of currently just like so inextricably linked with sort of structural racism and structural sexism and and these these um, family structures and so many so many aspects of our society that I think. Um, <coughs> To, to think through how how to start over, how to you know, like how to um, without the apocalypse. How do you do the it? Apocalypse. How do you do it without it? the apocalypse? Um, I mean, I think <laughs> hopefully we can, right? But but I think unless we're thinking outside of that system or imagining outside that system, we can't uh, we can't make any real change. I think you know maybe one company can, right? Um, but. But unless there's some, unless we're thinking outside the box, I'm not saying we have to completely decimate society to do that, right? But unless we're imagining things that don't rely on that system, you know, I don't know how we can move forward. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think I'd love to jump in here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, yeah, thank you for the question. I think that that's it's great. And I think that my reading of um, each of the presentations and certainly you know, what, um, the perspective that I'm bringing forward is really the latter, right? Not, not the former. So the issue isn't economic growth per se, it's extractivist free market capitalism as the model of economic growth. And I think one distinction that is um, implicit in all of the work that's been presented but that hasn't been kind of explicit, ex explicitly stated is the commitment to anti-anthropocentric or multi-species worldviews, right? Because it is the anthropocentrism of the model of growth that is at issue for me, right? And that I think the artists that we've brought together um, and, uh, and you know, the allies that we work with, um, this is one of the things that um, they, these artists are asking us to pay attention to through, as Krista said, um, mobilizing the power of art to speak speculatively, whether it's through speculative representation or speculative modeling of other worldviews, other possibilities that are beyond what is currently possible, right? So it's a different scale of modeling, right? Um, and so it's not just growth, but growth for whom, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what's important there, I think, for me, is the link between economy and ecology, right? The, the oikos, right, which is um, the home, right? And if we think of the home, right, not as the home for simply the patriarch, for simply the human, right, but um, an interwoven home for all, how does that shift notions of growth? From It shifts notions of growth, um, in, you know, first and foremost, uh, it shifts notions of growth into kind of uh, interrelated um, and uh, kind of complex ways of trying to account for who is living and dying when, right? And who is living and dying um, how? This is something that, of course, Donna Haraway asks us to think about. And then this is something that Andrew was um, asking us to think about um, through, um, you know, you didn't use the terms of situated knowledging, but of course, right, are you referencing um, what Haraway is calling for in her essay on situated knowledges, um, objectivity. Um, uh, now I'm spacing on the full title. <laughs> it's a little hot in here now, um, right? But situated knowledges is, is the is the you know the main title. And right, anyway. So what's important there, I think, is that what she's asking us to do is bring attention to the conditions of possibility for knowing, right? So that uh, it's not the God trick. We are not simply knowing without having to pay attention to which systems are allowing us to know and how. And so her call is for us to recognize the ethical imperative of accounting for how we come to our knowledges and our investment in those knowledges. So there's a deep situatedness, um, which I think incoherently right now, but in my notes here, I look forward to thinking about more in terms of how that relates to what we're thinking about in terms of growth, right? And the relationship between the home um, you know, the, the, the economy of the home um, and the ecology of the home, right? And why maybe we need to think through economy with ecology, right? Um, right. Yeah, so. and, and I had very similar thoughts and I was thinking about this, this question of growth in kind of two, on two sides. One is the, the very kind of real material conditions that we live in and we do live on a finite planet. And I think that, at least in my mind, I often forget that because there's, I think we get trained into believing from when we're very young. And I'm an educator and who's someone who, who kind of works in schools and education systems. We get trained to think about ourselves in terms of these kind of progressive creatures that are getting faster, stronger, better, all of these things as we go along through life. Um, but perhaps it's much more nuanced in terms of how we grow or learn or, or kind of know things about the world. Um, so the kind of finite limits of the planet is my first response in terms of this question of growth, uh, especially if we're thinking about current kind of extractivist or the way in which we extract value from the planet um, and specifically from the land that we, we kind of occupy in this place we call Canada. Um, it's very much based on extracting value from these, these bodies that we live with and, and depend upon um, in order to, to sell it in some sort of marketplace. So unless we radically kind of re reimagine what economics looks like, and, and there are models of this, right, speculative and otherwise, radically reimagining how these kind of entangled bodies and how value is created, then I think that we're just kind of uh, living with this illusion that, that we can sustain our current state of affairs. Like, I think it actually is an illusion. There's no way we can kind of continue in this linear 
uh, mode of progress that we think that, that we're able to do unless we move to Mars. Is that the, the option? Yeah. Just like right. colonize so another? Room, right? yeah. yeah, so there's the material side, but then it, like Natalie was touching on this more conceptual side and how I think we've learned to conflate the Earth, which is a finite material body, with a human-centered world. So the Earth has become our world, our Earth, instead of acknowledging mm -hmm. that this, this planet might not be for us. Um, perhaps we are in a, in a fantastic, amazing mistake. <laughs> um, as much of these kind of evolutionary kind of processes come out of these aberrations or mutations, um, we've kind of become a dominion so that we are able to dominate the, the earth, but it is perhaps not for us. And I know this is kind of a, you know, Eugene Thacker talks about it in, in terms of a cosmic pessimism. Maybe this is, there, you know, this, this world is not for us. And so what would it mean to actually think about ourselves in relation to all of the different bodies on, on which we, we rely, you know, in order to be human in the first place? So I always think about it in this, this idea of, and especially again in education, um, how we've kind of learned to think about everything based on this progressive, linear, kind of growth-based model of what it means to be kind of human being, to be human. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps that is harder to kind of untangle, but something that, that really art might be able to do, again, in terms of, of uh, shifting or these partial perspectives dilating what we're able to kind of know or perceive uh, in the first place. Yeah. So and on that note, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I want to say, um, uh, I want to give a minute for anybody who has a burning uh, last statement question issue that they want to kind of, um, offer before parting. Um, is there? Maybe I'll just say one quick thing. Um, in response to what you said about going to another planet, um, I do think, I've talked to Yasha Alabar a lot about this, uh, Natalie's partner, because um, he's a science fiction scholar, and uh, I do think that this is a really interesting time to read uh, um, science fiction authors' ideas about what one would do if one had the opportunity to start from scratch. Um, for example, colonizing Mars or, or whatever, or there's a planet, a problem with the planet that causes us to have to start over. I, I think that a lot of those ideas are founded in, in some really interesting theories and, and concepts about, different concepts about globalism, uh, fair critiques about things like identity politics and other things that are going on right now that, I, I, I'll just say one quick thing to just to consider. Um, I am no Trump fan uh, at all. In fact, I, I'm scared every day. Uh, I do a lot of reading. Um, but I want to say that I think that some of the things that, um, I'm not going to say that he's bringing them to pass so much as he's causing them to happen in his bumbling way. Um, I have a feeling that some of the things that, are, that he's causing to happen um, might actually be good opportunities for us to pull back and ask some real questions about how globalism has affected um, uh, the working class person uh, and why, why it is that there is this movement happening um, down there. And, and uh, it's easy to criticize him and his, his administration, and I will continue to do it. But I do think that it's worth seeing what happens uh, when some of the rules change uh, as a result of, of what he's doing, there may actually be some good things that come of some of those uh, some of those uh, bumbling experiments. So I don't know. We'll see. So, that, uh, so that's uh, actually opens up a whole new kettle of fish that we don't have time to get into. Um, but I will I will say that I'm glad, Andrew. Yes, indeed, um, this is the topic of my next book, which I'm working on all of this coming year. Uh, and uh, so uh, I will look forward to having the opportunity to think um, with all of you about these topics. Um, and the big question of, uh, in addition to a very, very important um, economic um, and technological and political um, concerns and reflections and interventions into the Anthropocene, what art can do, right? And how art as a category must be rethought in the context of ecological crisis. So thank you all for participating in this, and I think I'm handing over to Jeffrey. Yeah. I would like to uh, begin by thanking our uh, fabulous panel here and elsewhere. Uh, Natalie and Jesse for, for chairing, for organizing and, and chairing this. Uh, this is really, I learned a lot and I've been rapidly sort of skimming websites that were going up there, these fabulous works. And, and uh, thank you, Scott, for that performance. <laughs> I've seen the Orange Crush before but, <laughs> and I've even tried to play it, and, but I, I don't think I could make music out of it. Um, 
So I want to I want to pitch one thing. The Office of Sustainability, working with with us, uh, some of us in the Cool Institute and the Arts Research Collaboratory, have created a, a handout. There's a PDF that is up on their website, and we've got uh, you can you can you can get. Uh, paper copies from us. Uh, if you want to organize an e-conference like this yourself, they're not that hard to do. And so we've got a lot of resources. This is very University of Alberta centric, but I think it all applies to other institutions and something like that. These resources are no longer uh, rare. The last thing I want to do, uh, actually there are two things I want to do. I want to again thank the, the technical support people, Claire, and uh, Grant, who have been uh, from the Arts Resource Center, who have been helping us uh, uh, with this conference for years now and have done such a fabulous job. And they, they've done it not in their own space. We've moved to uh, this very interesting, for those who aren't uh, from the U of A, this hub mall. So we're in a sort of semi-public space, which, which may be why you heard uh, an emergency signal <laughs> test drive that they were doing early in the, in the event. Uh, but it's really terrific that the flexibility they've shown in bringing it here and bringing it to a more public space. Uh, I want to say a few things about tomorrow because uh, uh, this version of the Around the World Conference, it's not one long day. The very first one we did, I think, was 18 hours. I had to be taken out in a wheelbarrow <laughs> at, at, at the end. <laughs> I, I was actually introducing, I think, every speaker, so I, I, I wasn't allowed out of my, my suit either. Um, but this one, we're doing it like two hours or so every, every day over five days. And tomorrow, we have a fabulous set of panels around green philosophies, redefining our sustainable past and future. It's going to uh, start with a, a small panel chaired by um, Shannon uh, Studenbauer here at the University of Alberta with uh, colleagues from the University of Calgary and also here at Alberta. Then we're going to go to a panel by uh, brought together at the uh, Université de Montréal, um, brought together uh, on the subject of l'accès libre, un devoir moral et scientifique. And uh, this includes, for example, Jean-Claude Guédon, uh, Marcello Vitali, Michael Sinatra, Nicolas Sauré, Joanna Casanave. And uh, these are, uh, this, this panel will be in French, and so I encourage you all to, to still uh, to, to participate and to listen in. It's a fabulous group. We've had them before on the Around the World uh, uh, conference. And then we're gonna end with a keynote uh, by Terry Anderson, who is arguably one of the first people to try to organize uh, electronic conferences in the 90s and has a, a lot of experience thinking about the electronic conference and where it's going. So on that note, I again want to thank our, our chairs, our local and distant uh, artists for a, a really fascinating uh, panel. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you.